Hello, everyone. My name is Joanne Lockwood, and I'm your host for the Inclusion Bites podcast. In this series, I've interviewed a number of amazing people and simply had a conversation about the subject of inclusion, belonging, and generally making the world a better place for everyone to thrive. If you'd like to join me in the future, then please do drop me a line to joe.lockwood at cchangehappen.co.uk. That's S W E changehappen.co.uk. You'll be able to catch up with all of the previous shows on iTunes, Spotify, and their usual places. So plug in your headphones, grab a decaf, and let's get going. Today is episode 52 with the title, Assimilation is Not Necessary. And I have the absolute honor and privilege to be joined by my good friend, Hung Lee. Hung describes himself as someone who is the curator of recruiting brain food. When I asked Hung to describe his superpower, he said, I can see pointless futures. Hello, Hung. Welcome to the show. Joe, thank you so much for inviting me onto the show. I'm very, very pleased to be speaking with you. Very honored to be part of this amazing series. So great to be having this conversation with you. Awesome. Awesome. I've been a guest on your Brain Food Live several times. So it's, it's a real honor to have you back. So we were talking in the green room before we went live here about your your heritage and how and you said assimilation is not necessary for you. So what's that? What do you mean by that? Uh you know what? It's 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 an interesting challenge for anybody that has lived in a different country. I think you know if you if you're born in one place um, or you're from an ethnic background that is not native to a certain country, and you end up living in that country, um, uh, you know you do have all kinds of. Uh, uh, pressures, incentives, motivations uh, to assimilate. Um, and generally speaking, I think that, you know, of course you need to uh, 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 learn uh, the social rules. You need to obey the cultural values. You need to kind of really get involved with how uh, society and culture works in, in your local, uh, in, the, in the country you live in. Um, but it may be that you will never be fully uh, uh, fully part of that group without caveat. Um, and that's an okay position to be in. Um, I think sometimes when you're growing up, uh, as I did as a school kid, you know, as a, a slightly different school kid in a, in a very white working class and dust post industrial sort of place, um, uh, uh, that, that, you know, you, you don't want to be isolated. It's quite difficult as a child, I think, not to to be that child on the outside, you know, uh, that's why kids can stick in groups. That's why bullying develops because, you know, I think most of the time the bullies don't want to be the person bullied. So they end up, you know, preemptive striking on someone else. Um, so it's an uncomfortable position to be in. Um, and that was, you know, generally an experience I think most, um, you know, uh, uh, visible minorities, I, I would, I would imagine, uh, might experience. Um, and, and there's a big driver there to say, look, how can I belong better, uh, to avoid this pressure? You know, I remember being at school saying, you know, I, I don't actually want to be Chinese, um, because I'm getting bullied for it. Um, you know, I remember very clearly that was the case, you know, washing your face, making sure it goes whiter, you know, stuff like this. This is when I was five, six years old. Like really, really young, because uh, you, you don't understand things like this. Uh, you get you get mocked, for instance, for your color of your skin uh, by kids who don't know any better. Uh, you know, they, I certainly don't I bear them any animosity uh, now. I, I dare say I didn't bear too much animosity to them then. Um, but you know, they're saying that you're dirty. Um, you know, and you go home and you try and wash your face. Um, and that's what you do as a kid at, in that era, you know? Um, so that ends up being, you know, that can go in a wrong direction for you um, because there's a lot of potential for bitterness there. Um, you know, if you get to a point, for instance, where, you know, you, you, you realize that you, you, you're not going to be fully accepted. Uh, actually, let's, let's take this back to it. There's two paths you can go down, I think, when you're confronted with this. At a very young age where you're not prepared to deal with it, and, you know, there's no training as you get through this. As I say, five, six, seven years old, that, that type of age. Is that number one, you, you overcorrect to become like hyper assimilated, right? <laughs> you're like, you end up being like an exaggerated version of the people who are bullying you. Um, and I think that's when, in fact, you might end up being such a bully. Um, you end up just massively overcorrecting. Um, and, and, you know, that I don't think is a, a, a potentially good space to be. Um, and the other way people can deal with it is the, the overcorrect the other way 
and you end up rejecting the host culture that rejected you. Um, and you end up sort of being uh, a critic of it or, or even worse, like a, 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 an antagonist towards it. Um, and sometimes you can see that emerge as well, where, you know, you've grown up in one place, you've been confronted with this uh, strange situation where, you know, you've been repelled by this community that you think you should be part of. Um, and your response is, uh, okay, if you don't like love me, I don't love you. That's quite a normal experience anybody's gone through the period of rejection uh has that so it still doesn't go away right i mean uh, even as you go older you you kind of recognize what that emotion is and you realize you know what it's it's okay to be rejected um and i guess the title of this talk it's okay not to assimilate is is exactly that it's kind of okay to to not fully belong um because i think the wrong choice is is to either overcorrect and be hyper uh, assimilated um because truth is you probably will never belong and you can spend your entire life trying to prove otherwise um or if you turn into a hostile to the host environment uh that is the route towards um you know being a permanent marginalized person almost uh, uh, a marginalization that perhaps you've embraced um and maybe even you revel in um, and, you know, uh, 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 this is obviously something that doesn't happen to many people, but it is noticeable that, you know, when you look at instances of radicalization in the UK, uh, you know, people who have, have gone and, and, and uh, been radicalized in whatever sense, um, typically they're second generation immigrants like me. In other words, they, they speak like us. Um, you know, Four Lions uh, was a brilliant, brilliant movie. I don't know whether you've seen it, Joe, but it was a, uh, it was a, uh, everyone's seen it, right? Amazing. And everyone's, but they were all like from Yorkshire or whatever, <laughs> you know, but that was exactly it. The reason why they were radicalized is because they grew up here. First generation immigrants are never radical. Um, because they accept they'll never be fully accepted. Um, it's when you've grown up here and you get rejected by the host community that, you know, you, you, you can't justify that rejection. That's when you can overcorrect and become super negative and potentially be hostile. And like I say, these days, very easy to get radicalized. So, yeah, I guess what I'm saying when, you know, assimilation isn't all that is to say, of course, you should assimilate. But you know what? Don't kill yourself and don't kill anybody else if uh, uh, if that assimilation isn't complete. That's simply a fact of life. Um, it's a fact of who you are. It's a fact of your journey that you and your family have made. Um, and there's no reason why you should be resentful for that. As, as you're talking now, I was, I was just thinking about, you know, I talk about belongingness in the workplace and you've just talked about belongingness in, in the culture, in society. And as you're talking about that, I was thinking how we can see different types of people. It, he's almost using the model you just described in our work. It, so there's the person who is engaged, feels that sense of belonging. Then we have the people that are kind of like meh in the middle, kind of okay, nothing special. And then we have the actively disengaged. And, and the analogy I heard recently was you know, the active, di actively disengaged person will just scrunch up a bit of paper and throw it on the floor and walk off. They won't even think about it. The, kind of, the person is kind of meh, okay. We'll see that bit of paper on the floor, notice it, and just walk past and leave it. But the person who feels that sense of belonging, that sense of community, will see that bit of paper, pick it up, and, and find a bin and put it and throw it away. And I think that's what you're saying here is when you think about when you're engaged in, in society, in the community, unless you feel that sense of belonging, you're you're never going to feel part of the community. And I'm not talking about assimilation here. I'm just talking about that that cultural element that we talk about so often. Yeah, there's definite parallels, you know. I mean, everyone's worked in a company where there's malcontents. Um, uh, you know, people who are, you can see that they're actively uh, sabotaging um, initiatives, you know, that they're, they're doing everything. They're basically trying to communicate they don't want to be here. Um, and in um, in a company, of course, um, the difference, I guess, uh, is that, you know, the person can leave and join another company. Um, uh, slightly different when you're talking about a wider culture because that person may not be be able to leave it um, and so they just end up curdling their bitterness 
uh, to a point where you know it can just be super super negative. Um, so so that's an urgent issue, um, and it's an urgent issue you know in terms of how we think about creating uh, the environment where everybody has a chance to uh, belong to a certain extent. Um, like I think a big part of the problem is that we present an unrealistic possibility um, to say it is possible to be um, universally inclusive to 100% level um, uh, to, to be able to say, oh, you know, we're going to, this is good. We're going to guarantee this to be the case. What I'm saying from my own experience as a, as a you know, ethnic minority, let's say in the UK, it, certainly an immigrant as well. The UK is my third country I lived in. So, you know, I've, I've had experiences of not being in, in, in this place. Um, or not so so called belonging in this space is that I don't think we should hang that sort of we shouldn't set ourselves that standard. Um, uh, you know we should accept we should try and increase inclusivity. That's the journey we're all on. Uh, but to assume that you can be one hundred percent inclusive to one hundred percent of the people one hundred percent of the time. I don't think that's ever going to leave the ideation period. You know, that's not realistic. Um, and we need to just have the sense, look, we're, we're moving towards this. Um, and, you know, that, that forward progress in itself, I think, might be, might be enough. Yeah, and I think companies make this mistake as well. When they're trying to be inclusive for all, they end up, I don't know, either constrained or by the impossibility of the task or or then you become open to extreme views you're tr- when you're trying to include all views sometimes there, there are views at the periphery either hard right hard left and sometimes those views uh, drown out the kind of centrist views which are often the most the, the most yeah, prevalent and we see that in society we see that often in the workplace so, so you you can't I think there's the, the the paradox of tolerance. You know, you have to be intolerant of the intolerant, and then you, as an organisation, as a society, we need to work out what is the message, the underlying tone of of who we are, and we we would expect people to feel inclusion within that zone. And if you're outside of that, then you will feel less inclusion. I'm sure, and how do we, we can't change that. I don't think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you say, the paradox of diversity, right? Paradox of tolerance, that is something we should all actually study up on and, and, and learn what that is. Um, you know, for folks uh, listening to this, definitely, if you're going to emerge from this chat for whatever reason, just Google paradox of tolerance um, and that will tell you, you know, at what point do you draw the line? And that's basically the, the situation. I actually don't think the terminology helps, uh, Joe. I've got to be honest, when we talk about inclusion, for instance, um, that in itself is a bit of an oxymoron because we, we recognize implicitly the certain things that we do not include. Um, in the same way, when we talk about diversity, um, they, w- implicitly, there's certain things that we will not t- tolerate. Um, so I don't think the terminology helps because the terminology tells us that, yes, it's universally inclusive and universally diverse. That's not the case. Um, What community is and what... um uh, any social organization is they're formed at the gate you know there is a barrier um, between who is in and who is out um, and like it or not what we do is that we create some sort of gate and we say if you if you uh, agree to these principles these values these laws uh, these cultural mores whatever it is then you know you may be in group um, but there is always an out group um, and the question is, what is that out group? And are you comfortable with kind of being hostile to that group of people? Um, that's the social reality. That's evolutionary reality. Um, and I think in many cases, the uh, conversations in DE and I, I think, have not recognized that. Um, and they're still kind of uh, pouring towards uh, a, a, an abstraction that isn't ever going to connect with reality. Um, and, you know, the terminology doesn't help us there. I, no, I agree. I, I think a lot of people see DNI a, as a phrase. They don't necessarily understand the outcome or the output of a positive experience. Now, I talk about positive people experiences, and that's what we're trying to generate. We're trying to create environments where people feel they, they have the ability to thrive. You know, the government at the moment talking about levelling up which is recognizing that some people need more help, more assistance, whether that's regional infrastructure, whatever that is, to be able to succeed. And you know, looking at the north-south divide, looking at how different regions of the UK need more support and investment in infrastructure. And also recognize that some people, we, we, you know, we can talk about 
disabled parking spaces or, or accessible parking spaces outside of shots, parent parking spaces, giving people f- facilities to help them survive and thrive in a better way in their experience. So th- that's what we're trying to really do. It's not just about inclusion and diversity. We're recognizing the needs of individuals or the needs of groups and communities and giving them that equity. And I think that's that's what we often miss. It's around the equity side and, and the sense of belongingness. I feel part of something bigger. I feel that alignment. I don't feel, as you as you put it, sort of rejecting the host culture, rejecting the the, the, the culture where I am. I'm I'm not assimilated because I, I want to bring myself to work. I want to bring myself into the community and recognize who I am. But I feel very much that I'm celebrated for that, not tolerated for that. Yeah, and you know what? The the idea that people are rejecting the host culture in it is itself part of politics these days. Um, I mean, there is a there is a a, a strand within DEI that does reject the host culture. Um, you know, th- these are the people that uh, to talk a lot about white supremacy, for instance, um, or people who talk about colonial structures and stuff like this. I I, I occasionally talk about these things um, because those structures are historical and they're real. Um, the question is, what do you do about that? Um, um, you know, what do you do about the outcomes at ground level when you know that a person that is uh, speaking in a certain way, gone through a certain path, is going to have uh, uh, a significantly different uh, life opportunities than someone who's born in a different place? We only have to look at our own sort of government. Um, uh, you know, there's the, like almost every prime minister the UK has ever had has gone to Eton, all right? Um, you know, a single private school. So you, know, you we can't really talk the story uh, when things are self-evident uh, in, in this way in super important and prominent spaces. So, um, yes, there is a strand to say um, you, uh, we, we have an unjust system, we have an unjust world, let's say that's all true. What do we do about it? Um, you know, what are the best techniques to provide the best outcomes for as many, for the most people um hopefully without uh you know uh, too much uh, pain in the switching of it um and i think that's that's where i'm sitting a little bit like what what is the pain to switch this because uh, sometimes that's worth thinking about um there's a lot of younger people particularly are very much like you know let's overturn everything and start from scratch and zero and stuff like this and i'm thinking you know what uh, revolutions typically don't end well um and and typically uh, uh, they can be extraordinarily painful uh, and in fact, you f- you'll find if you ever speak to anybody who's gone through a revolution, um, uh, they actually would be very conservative about uh, uh, some of the things that you're advocating for. Um, so I'm an incrementalist. Um, I do believe you, you, you can change in 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 in, in moments and steps. Um, I don't think it's about systemic overhaul. It's about it's about kind of. Uh, uh, moderating and modifying the system from ground up. Um, and if the system is resistant, uh, you know, truly resistant, it can't actually uh, do anything other than the, the, than to, to, to sit where it is and suppress, then it's about creating a parallel structure rather than try and destroy it. Uh, you just, you know, create something that you would prefer to do differently and, you know, enjoy that space. And uh, eventually if, if uh, uh, that space is has enough support, uh, the, the old structures might simply disappear um, because of lack of interest and lack of use. Mm. I remember being in Poland in the late 90s. So that's what, less than 20 years after the uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, et cetera, et cetera. And I met Lech Wałęsa, who was instrumental in the solidarity movement, um, in the shipyard, who is credited as being one of the people that brought significant change to Eastern Europe and the fall of the Berlin Wall and all that time. And I was talking to my Polish friends, and whilst the world saw Lech Wałęsa as his saviour, this hero, this, this, this person that brought this radical change, he was almost demonised in the country because he brought poverty, food shortages worse than under the communist rule. So it was a generational change that had to occur. But in the meantime, the pain, whilst it was worth it, was caused the, the people at the time to think actually it wasn't so bad after all. And we look, we look back now, and you have to make. I mean, we look at how apartheid fell in South Africa. We look at the, the, the significant changes we had to make in Northern Ireland, how the peace process worked. You, you have to kind of sometimes you have to be radical to bring change. But I, I also agree that 
sometimes the evolution and incremental approach can work better where the fundamentals aren't completely broken there's a lot of survivor bias to that i think um you know in other words let's say you have a revolution um it's devastating um but the people who are devastated are, are gone uh, for whatever reason um and then the people who stay are the ones that can build if you like the new the new zion um uh, that's the dream for any kind of person who's a pol- political politically activated right uh, they want to see a revolution all the bad guys they're irredeemable let's get rid of them um in whatever reason you know uh however we how which way that happens and then let's build a new paradise um i think that's naive um, and I, I think it doesn't take into account that the human cost of doing that is hugely significant. Um, and you do need to account for those people that lose out. Um, big part of the problem I think we have in, in uh, culture today is that is this type of uh, conversations we have where uh, we have uh, people who definitely want to have, um, you know, revolutionary change, they're tired of incrementalism, they're, they've lost faith in it, uh, which I totally understand, you know, I, I get that, uh, that sense. Um, and then you have people that are, are resistant to it because they recognize, oh, if this does change, then actually my current position uh, we might call that privilege. Somebody, some some observers might understand that to be privilege. They will defend that privilege. Of course, they would. Um, uh, you know, uh, no one would willingly give up their their their, their plus points in society um, without some sort of compensation or without some sort of potential for them to get even more plus points in this new world. So you have this clash between uh, left and right. Um, and and sadly, what I'm seeing is that uh, it, it just seems that. Um, we're spiraling into a huge uh, into negativity uh, to the point where it might be very very difficult to pull back. I mean, we're in the UK. We saw the Brexit scenario. Um, I'm sure most of us would look at this now and think, "Oh my goodness, that was probably a bad idea to have that vote. It was so divisive." Um, uh, you know, how, how are we ever going to get beyond this? Um, but of course, it's going to keep trundling forward. Um, and you know, the forces are aligned. Um, you know, you can see. Uh, there's a reason why the Conservatives are consistently delivered as the uh, government of this country. Um, much to the astonishment, by the way, of you know a lot of people on social media, a lot of people in all media were like, we're stunned. Like, how can this happen? Um, well, you know, maybe um, it's the case that in terms of their cultural positioning, um, even though you may find that abhorrent, um, it actually chimes with you know, more people than not in this country. Um, now, if that is the case, we need to really think about this because if we continue to agitate for revolutionary change, um, oftentimes that just simply means being uh, outside of uh, control of that change. We're just going to be in opposition um, uh, for forever. Um, and in the meantime, uh, the right wing will bed down and continue to um, uh, to create their constituents in whatever way. Um, you know, we can see, for instance, um, and it's now gone super political, right? But um, we can see, for instance, that there's a perception in, in conservative politics and probably true for any politics is that the way in which you create lefties is to send them all to university. Um, certainly a cynic, cynical take uh, on uh, Blair's attempt to widen higher, higher education is oh, what, what he's doing is actually trying to create more future labor voters, which probably is true. Um, that is the outcome. And then, of course, you now start seeing people like Grant Schnapp saying, you know what, uh, our problem with H- HGV drivers uh, shortage is because Blair sent them all to university. They should be driving trucks. Um, and you can understand what the – it's hardly a subtext, right? Um, he's literally telling you um, higher education creates lefties, um, working men's jobs creates righties. Um, and so let's say we have the conservatives in power. They've been power the last 20 years or so, haven't they? Um, uh, yeah, something like that, ridiculous long period of time, um, despite the fact there's all kinds of crap that's gone through, big financial crash, uh, Brexit, COVID, mishandling, all this stuff, they're still there, uh, right? And if you went out and did an election today, they would still be delivered as the biggest party in, 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 in the government. Um, in 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 Parliament, uh, no question, right? There's no even not even a question that they would not be the biggest party. So we need to ask ourselves some real questions, like, okay, uh, if if the, the the baseline people believe this, how is it that 
that is the case? Um, and what is it that's really important to those people? Because um, it is quite alarming uh, that you know traditionally working class uh, regions have now gone to the conservatives. Um, uh, you know, places where I'm from, in the northeast, that's like gone to the conservatives. How you know the conservatives don't speak na- natively to that population. Uh, but they've managed to do it, um, and, and I think the, the reason why they've done it is because they're they're culturally and socially conservative, um, and that speaks to those regions. Um, uh, whereas Labour have turned into uh, basically culturally progressive, but that speaks to people in metropolitan centres that have typically gone through a university process. Um, and we, I'm a university person, I'm, I'm kind of progressive, we, and I live in a big metropolitan space, but we then cluster in these metropolitan spaces, which doesn't actually deliver the votes um, into uh, this flawed system that we have, you know, it's not about popular vote. It's about where those votes are distributed. Um, and so oh, as well, well and good, you're living in Manchester, London, uh, Newcastle, big cities like that. But you know what? Uh, surrounding all of those big cities are actually, you know, 25 more seats uh, that go to con- culturally conservative uh, people who message culturally conservatively. Um, so, you know, w- we... Uh, in the the world, people who are listening to this podcast, Joe, uh, probably would lean on social progressive side, I would imagine. Um, uh, but I don't think uh, tactically we've, we've got it right at all. I think t- our tactics are absolutely fucking embarrassing. Um, uh, and they're obviously wrong. Um, and they're obviously going to put us in a position where we get marginalized. We need to get, be smarter and understand how this political system works um, and moderate um, our communication to, to talk to the people. People that are rejecting uh, uh, rejecting a lot of the ideas that we have. Hmm. I, I, I agree with a lot of the insight there. Yeah, you, you hit nail on the head in a lot of it. And I, coming back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier about privilege, and also this, in, in order to bring change, often people are impatient and they want to bring rapid change. Uh, and I find what happens maybe. In, in the world of workplace, or when we think about DNI uh, as a sort of kind of a, uh, a, a topic, is that what happens is when you're challenged, again, your privilege is challenged, you tend to retreat back into your castle. You tend to pull the drawbridge up. You tend to start defending yourself, you know, arrows over the ramparts, boiling oil onto the people trying to attack you. So you're, you're defending. And what we don't often do is because we haven't got the patience for change is we don't start a dialogue. We don't discuss why we need the people in the castle to come and meet us on the drawbridge and get around the table and have lunch and have a chat about what's going on. We end up polarizing into these two camps, the I've got it and you want it camp. And then we end up with this argument about, as you, I think, as you said, people feel they're going to lose something and leveling up becomes people perceive and they're leveling down. You know, when you have privilege, when you have access to social capital, you feel that by giving to somebody else, you're losing yourself. You're, you're giving something away. Uh, and I think a lot of the change we're trying to bring is dialogue-based, conversational, evolutionary change. But this, we're, we're almost persuaded that we need to be on the edge. We need to be either hard right or hard left. And it's having these conversations. And I think our politics in this country is also based on the same left or right, hard left, hard right. And the centre ground just doesn't that seem to have a voice. It, it's always the case when there's these points of, of, of conflict that the centre ground disappears because you end up uh, perceived by both sides as some sort of compromiser, right? So, so let's say you're left and right or whatever it is. Generally speaking, most people are in the middle, I think. Most sensible people, I would say, everywhere on the planet are probably generally, you know what, live and let live. What's the big deal? Let's just, you know, we, I understand that everything I feel is not the same as everything another person feels, but we can probably find a way to get along. It's not that big a deal. Um, however, we get tugged into these extreme positions um, by, as you say, the most active and most louded voices. Um, and the truth is the people on the edges tend to care about it more. Um, and so they are more active, right? So in terms of their prominence in discourse, they become um, uh, much more uh, prominent than their numbers might suggest. This is the noisy minority idea, but I think it generally f- applies. Um, uh, you know, someone who goes and joins a, a, a political group, for instance, a political party, some sort of advocacy group or whatever, they probably care a lot. Um, but that's actually a small percentage of the people um, in the country. Most people in the country do not actually 
orientate their lives around politics um, or, or social change. They orientate their lives around what they're doing, their family, their friends, their hobbies, their, you know, uh, their work, all this type of stuff. And yes, they'll go out and vote. And yes, they care about things, but not as much. Um, and what happens is you get these uh, extremists. And I, I don't want to use the word extremists in a derogatory way, but you, as we're presenting this as a spectrum, people at the extreme edges of it tend to be hyper-motivated um, uh, to all of these things to an extent that actually all those other elements of life is now subjugated to this mission that they're on. They're very much like, oh, there's nothing else going on in their lives other than this <laughs> this advocacy or this posture, this political position they have. Um, and they end up um, uh, amplified, obviously, with the technologies, the communication tech that we now have um, and become very visible and powerful um, narrative shapers um, in, in the world that we're at. Um, and of course, we now understand how it works online where, you know, inevitably you end up uh, engaging positively with content that you uh, emotionally resonates with you. So in other words, you get to see more of that. And then before you know it, you're in some sort of uh, echo chamber where all all you're doing is getting validation for your beliefs. Um, and once you have that echo chamber going, basically you have an internal competition within the people in the echo chamber, right? So if I have joined some sort of echo chamber of whatever political uh, social description, um, uh, there will be an internal competition within that group as to who is the, 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 the best or, or the most committed person with the ideology. Um, and it's, a, it's basically a race to purity. Um, so anybody who has a dissenting view or anybody who might, you know, actually, I, I, I broadly, I'm aligned with what you're saying, but have you thought about this? You get hammered down. Um, and that is true whether you join whatever group you want to join, like go and, go and join a, go and join, uh, surreptitiously go and join a right-wing group. You know, have you done that? Um, I have. Um, it's quite interesting um, because you can start seeing, okay, actually anybody with a descending group gets hammered. It's like very similar policing um, to what you would find in a left-wing group. And it's just a condition of um, uh, this sense that, you know, people who feel they have access to the truth. So here's a few things I think I want to share. Uh, firstly, when you become uh, ideological like this, um, uh, there's a few things that need to happen bef uh, before you're able to become ideological. Like I say, most people are not this way, but it's possible to become this way. Um, and the people who are this way tend to be the noisiest. Number one, you need to believe there's such a thing as an objective truth. But you need to believe it's actually objective. Oh, there is an objective truth out there. It's not all about, you know, social complexity. There's a truth. Um, so you need to believe that. Secondly, you need to believe you have access to that truth. Um, in other words, there is a truth and you can actually see it. Thirdly, you need to be a person that thinks, you know what, it's unique that I can see it. And actually lots of people can't see it, but I have this access to the truth. Fourthly, you need to see, right, I need to then evangelize about the truth because there's people out there that obviously don't know the truth. I'm going to tell them that. Fifthly, there are people that you then think the people that know the truth, but deny the truth. They're the people that need to be destroyed. And that is the route to being a, a, any kind of extremist. That is the path that you take. Those five conditions need to apply. Um, now, knowing all of this, or at least this is my theory, this is my version of the truth, a meta truth, if you like, um, is to say, you know what, we need to have more doubt, Joe. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we need to have more doubt. Uh, we need to go and approach, uh, you know, the world that we see and, and, and not be so damn certain about things. Um, not be so damn sure that that's the case um, because the truth is you can't access the objective truth. It is all just a story you're telling mainly to yourself um, and you've got to tell yourself a better story um, but don't ever forget that it is a story. <laughs> it's not the truth. You can't see it. I love that. I love that. I Listen to what you said about, yeah, you joined a, a far-right extremist group. Uh, I actually subscribe to articles and newsletters from a an extreme radical feminist group who are at heart trans-exclusionary. And I, I dip myself into this <laughs> Kool-Aid um, every, every so often and read their letters, read their news articles, listen to their podcasts, watch some of their blog stuff. And, and 
I find it really hard not to trigger and to get, and, and, but I, I feel it's always important not to sit in my own echo chamber. I have to hear the other truths, the other opinions. And I'm not saying I want to be assimilated into that. I want to, I want to go down those, those rabbit holes, but I need to understand what the rabbit holes are, what, what people are saying so that I, my truth is tested as often as I can with other truths or other views. And as, as a, as a, as a quote or a saying by Paul Sappho, which is strong opinions weakly held. And right. that is around having your view, but not holding it so tight that you can't let go. And then the creative doubt is challenging yourself, looking for information that doesn't fit, proving yourself wrong rather than going, see, I'm right. It's those why questions. Why do I think that? And that's extremely important to balance. Do you know the what? There's one thing that is 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 useful to think about when it is with ideas is that too many people, I think, become personally attached or emotionally attached to those ideas. Um, so much so it becomes part of their identity, um, which is why, you know, people end up label it, self-labeling, right? I am an ist of some type. Um, and, and that is part of their identity. Clearly, the ideas are part of their identity. I, I've always resisted this. Um, and the reason why is because I think ideas ideas are tools to use. They're tools that you use to interpret the world, um, but they are fairly disposable tools. If you find a better idea, you need to put the old idea down and pick up the better tool. Um, that is the journey towards trying to find a better way rather than holding fast to an idea uh, and then you know shutting yourself off from other inputs because you know, you've know you emotionally committed to this position. Um, I think that's uh, generally, uh, generally it's an error uh, but I understand why people make it because it means that you don't need to think so much. It's, it's actually, like uh, I'm fortunate. One of the the weird uh, 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 sort of uh, I guess I'm fortunate in the sense I enjoy thinking. Um, uh, you know the activity of po po pondering things. <laughs> it's like yeah, I spend time doing that. It's my entertainment. Uh, but I know that's not always the case for a lot of people, and it's not the case for me in certain topics. Certain topics I don't want to think anymore. I just shut it off and get on with other things I want to think about. Um, and I think with regards to politics, oftentimes people don't enjoy exploring these things. They want to commit early to this thing, shut off the brain waves, and never think about it again uh, because that's their that's that's how how their life is. As you get older, by the way, talking about ages, but as you get older, typically your energy goes down and your effort in terms of constantly trying to re-examine the world also declines, which is why, you know, why my grandma is super conservative, why everyone's grandma is super conservative, because at some point she got too tired about it and doesn't want to think about these things anymore. She, she wants to spend the rest of her time, you know, doing things that she enjoys. Totally human, totally understandable. Um, but that we now understand it, um, I think we need to apply that understanding to some of the conversations and dialogues we're seeing online or, or even in person. It's happening, whatever it is, and, and realize, okay, uh, how can I uh, contribute positively to this? How can I, you know, uh, uh, not contribute negatively? Because it's, it's probably easier to contribute negatively than it is positively, I'm afraid to say. It's, it's destructively negatively rather than constructively negatively, isn't it? I mean, you think about science. Science is the art of, of doubt, isn't it, almost? So every, every, science is basically a sequential set of theories that people are trying to test and disprove. Even the people that create the theory spend their entire life trying to disprove the theory in order to, to test whether the theory is valid, like Einstein, E equals MC squared. It's still only a theory. And as science has evolved, technology has evolved, there's a refinement in there. There's a different perspective at the quantum level of physics and things. So there are anomalies in there. So I think if we can apply what we do with science and the evolution of of truth in that in that sphere to the evolution of truth in the social sphere as well, that would allow us as a society to evolve and not be be, be forced to the edges all the time. You know, we, we're allowed to explore those truths. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, um, science is not obviously without its own uh, ideo ideo ideologies. Um, uh, you know, the science of, uh, uh, was it the uh, 
this, uh, the, the, something uh, Thomas Kuhn wrote the book uh, about the scientific revolutions, and there are, there is emotional commitment to certain ideologies that you have based on science. Even Einstein himself might arguably be the case when he had that conversation with Niels Bohr about quantum physics and all the rest of it. However, um, at root of all of the ideologies we can choose from, at root the concept of look, it's constantly about experimentation. It's constantly about can we prove it and can we use it as a predictive value. Uh, that makes for me the basic principles of science I have much more sympathy towards um, than uh, things that are a little, a little bit more axiomatic, um, which are typically as a result of some great thinker writes something down um, and then that thing becomes unchallengeable. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to see how, you know, the, 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 the gap between uh, religious ideology and political ideology actually disappears when you take it in, into it with that lens. Um, it's usually some great hero that has an interpretation of the world as it is. They write it down and then that book becomes like the, the unchallengeable truth. Um, for me, there's not a huge amount of difference between someone who thumps the Bible and says, this is how it is. Uh, Joe, uh, is it possible to stop this call momentarily? And re uh, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, basically a delivery I've got to pick up. Give me a sec. Is that okay? One sec. Yeah. So I think I just nipped off to pick up his delivery. So we'll... Uh, uh, yeah, leave it time. Bro. There he is. He's, uh, I can hear he's asking the door. He's letting the people in. I'm sure he'll be back in a sec. All right. That was exciting. Okay. The only reason why I'd interrupt you, Joe, is because I'm, I'm basically taking an order of a toy dinosaur that I'm giving to my, my nephew for his fifth birthday. Um, and it's like an essential essential item I, I, <laughs> that needs to be collected. It's like I can't not collect this thing. Um, uh, so I anyway. On this podcast, it's one take, no cuts. So yeah. if your mum phones, you have a dog on your lap, or the Amazon person delivers, then it, it, it's part of the podcast. It's, it's Yeah, amazing. They, they, there you go, a bit of real life there. Um, anyway, what I was saying, there was not a huge amount of difference between your tub thumping Bible preacher and some you know young Marxist who talks about Das Kapital all the time. They're still committed to this great thinker or this book that they think is true. Um, but really, it's a version of a possible truth uh, that is deeply flawed. And what we have to do is like mature human beings to recognize those facts and be comfortable with that amb ambiguity, uh, be comfortable with the fact that we can't truly know what's out there. Um, I think it's a deeply humbling thing to, 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 to take that position because it makes you curious about the world and it makes you kind of want to explore what possible uh, uh, stuff is out there rather than uh, overcommit um, to something that someone has said. Yeah, I noticed but when, we, when you uh, completed the show notes beginning um, for this, you put your superpower down as I can see pointless futures. What do you mean by that as your superpower? What's, what's the pointless futures you, you, you are referring to? All right, so I, I'm going to refer to something I don't think I've ever told anybody, but I think this is also one of those unprovable truths, right? Um, but but I, I've, I've stopped trying to prove or disprove this. Um, I've just learned to accept that this may be the case. Um, but uh, the, the, the reality is I, I genuinely believe I've, I've predicted the future, um, not in terms of me being a futurologist, but literally I've seen the vision of it in a prophetic way. Um, however, um, these instance, instances or episodes are always like ridiculously trivial. Um, uh, that have no impact to anybody whatsoever. Uh, so there'll be a scene that I've foreseen um, that has no sort of, uh, there's, there's no, literally, there's, there's no consequence to this. you will be like, oh yeah, I saw this person walk into this room. It would be something like that. I see it. And then it happens years, decades down the line, and that thing has occurred. And I'm thinking, okay, did I actually, you know, predict the, that pointless future? It's pointless because it's useless, right? The, literally, uh, the, that foresight has given me no access to anything. Um, and it potentially can put you into some sort of um, existential crisis because it, does it then mean, oh, the world is fixed and life is, is all predestined or what? I don't think about that. There's no point in me speculating. I don't have the uh, uh, intelligence to figure it out. And I just accept it as what it is. Um, so yeah, it's a pointless future and it's a pointless superpower. That's really interesting. When I was a lot younger, so in my late teens, early 20s, I used to have these kind of, as you say, these premonition type foreseeing an event that suddenly came to pass. And 
I got kind of quite, I don't know, confused by the whole thing because certain things occurred and I knew what the person was going to tell me. I knew what was going to happen. I I almost thought, foretold my dem- my undoing in a particular job, and I, I had no belief that I would go past a certain date, and that came to pass. So I could never see myself in the future. I could only ever see myself stopping at some point. And I had this premonition that I would die in a fireball in a, a light aircraft, a two-seater type light aircraft. And so... I've always avoided any opportunity to go in a, a, a small aircraft. Um, and this is since the age of 19 or 20. I'm not saying I'm afraid of flying. I'm not saying I'm afraid of a light aircraft. I've just got this vision of going up in a puff of smoke. In a- I, would, I would thoroughly recommend you stay with your rule of not entering into that type of, uh, that type of vehicle, Joe. Um, you know, so don't do it. Irrational. <laughs> Completely irrational. Uh, well, it's like, the only way I can prove myself wrong is to, is to fly in an aircraft, but then I might prove myself right. It's exactly. Like- there, there's no point in demonstrating the proof of it. It's like, yeah, just take the easy, take the take the ra- the rational choice is not to take an irrational risk. So yeah, yeah don't do it. <laughs> my, my last my last words would be, oh shit. I was right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What does that give you? You know what I mean? You're not winning at life. You're ending it. So yeah, don't do that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, fortunately, I think as as I've grown older, and I guess because as you as you get older, you you get more lived experiences. There's so much going on in your head. Maybe you don't have the opportunity to sort of think those things are unusual. I don't know, but I, I can tend to predict lines in, in movies. You know, when they're talking. But then that, that's just understanding language and understanding how people write movies. You know, you can almost predict the next line sometimes. Uh, and I'm often doing that. People go, "Hey, you know, they were going to say that." I just well, it just felt like the right thing to say next. Um, mm. Whether that's a premonition or whether it's just being in the moment and understanding language constructs and, and how people talk to each other. So, um, but no, I, I, I get the idea that you can kind of have this pointless premonition uh, of, of something that is insignificant. Uh, maybe Always are, trivial. Maybe yeah. are, Always are, trivial. We are just in the matrix. We're in the matrix. And this whole existence is, is, is made up in our own experience their heads or whatever yeah that's that is a, a, that is a distinct possibility and that's okay as well you know <laughs> it's like it shouldn't give us any angst that's just how it is um i'm cool with it i mean yeah. my reality is still good i'm not i'm not telling fact, yeah, yeah, exactly. reality is a reality within a reality it doesn't matter it's still my reality <laughs> exactly right exactly right so you started uh your brain food um well, it starts off as a an e sign in the old days, and now a, a, a blog, and then you curate it into a kind of a weekly newsletter. How, how did that come about? How did you s- set about ideating that? It, you know what? It was one of those where the it was a personal problem. Uh, it, it was it was a case where essentially the the the, the internet just got too big. Um, you know, it got too big to process, too big to to, to manage. Uh, no one could actually, you, you encountered great content all the time, but you could never f- retrieve it or you could never consume it when you found it. Uh, I still I still think that's a pro- prevalent thing to, uh, to this day where, you know, you, you might be getting involved with something. Um, uh, you know, you might discover something online. It's amazing. Um, but you, right now you're in the middle of something. You can't read it and, you know, you never go back to it. Uh, it's, it's gone. Uh, and that was like deeply frustrating to me for a long time because I thought, you know what, there's an educational piece here that could really help me understand this topic a bit better. Um, and I ended up just starting to bookmark things and archiving it. Um, and I think I'm a bit of a taxonomist at heart in the sense, you know, I like to label things and make sure I can retrieve it properly and all this. Anyway, I was doing this out of habit. And then I realized over time that I'd actually built up a really good database that was actually organized um, uh, for, you know, HR recruiting type topics. I thought, wow, this is actually really useful. Um, And it just occurred to me to think, okay, if this is useful to me, then maybe it could be useful to others. What's the uh, easiest way in which I can make this accessible to other people? And, uh, and yeah, it was just simply a case of, look, why don't I just write a newsletter and pick out a couple of these items um, and just more openly share what I was doing anyway. And if people want to read it, and great. If they don't, that's also great. Um, and, you know, maybe it helps somebody. And, and that's basically how Brain Food, uh, Brain Food started. Mm-hmm. I remember having conversations with you probably a year or two back when you sort of 
gave me your kind of ethos and rules. You know, it, it always has to go out at the same time every week. It has to have the same format, has to be dependable, has to be consistent. So people know what recruiting brain food is. It doesn't go and have a special one week, do something different. It's always the same, which gives it that reliable, comfortable feeling, doesn't it? I, I read it probably once or twice a month I, I dive in it i happen to be free on a sunday morning i flick through it i look at some of the articles that are extracted from that on linkedin and i know what i'm going to get and it's it is dependable isn't it it, it is and and th- there's th- i think this is just about you know um well the world is so busy everyone is attention uh, uh, the competition for attention is just uh, you know extremely challenging i mean if people are still listening to this uh, conversation at 49 minutes in you know that's actually really good that they're still here because there's all kinds of other distractions out there um so i realized that you know one of the things that you want to do when you're trying to build audience is to is to create a, a, a very a steady rhythm uh you need to be super consistent and that's for two reasons number one you've got to make it easy for you to do um and once you kind of make something into a routine for yourself then actually the production of it becomes easier to do because it's a thing um think about going to the gym uh, uh, or something or starting some sort of regular exercise that's a classic example of when if you're episodically doing things you're never going to get there because every time you, you have this traumatic decision making thing saying can i be bothered to go to the gym um and you know more times than not you're going to say no i can't be bothered you won't do it um but if you remove it from your decision making next uh, sort of cortex it's like literally you're doing it because that's what you do on sunday morning or whatever it is then it suddenly becomes less mental work it's no longer a decision you make so i think for anybody building audience or building content you stick to, get a rhythm stick to the cadence and you know do it um because then it, you take it out of your decision making uh, matrix so to speak and it becomes something that you can consistently deliver the second side of the reason why consistency is value is obviously the reader side, um, because the reader knows to expect this thing at this point. Um, and I first came to, to realize this when, um, you know, I got habituated to newsletters I was subscribing to that were similarly regular. And I noticed I read those and not the ones that were irregular um, because the irregular ones, what's the difference between that and another email, right? Um, so I thought, right. I started reading certain emails, uh, newsletters sent at a certain time. I realized I've got to do the same with brain food because in the same way I've habituated myself as the producer of this newsletter, I've got to habituate the audience to, as the consumer of the newsletter. They should also <laughs> you know, consume this because that's what they do on a Sunday morning or do on a Monday morning or whatever it is they want to read it because obviously it sits in the inbox. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's got to be consistent all the way through. That's, that's, it seems to me a very clear pattern in terms of if you're a, a content creator or curator, uh, you generally want to have a cadence to it um, rather than sporadically do things. So, so you didn't set out, what, 200 odd episodes ago. Uh, is it around 200 you're at now? Is it? 267. I think 268 goes out this Sunday. So yeah, it's been a five years plus, you know, long time. So, so day one, this wasn't. This was kind of like a side hustle. This was like a curiosity thing. Did you ever imagine it was going to turn into sort of like the main gig? Um, no, 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 not at all. I mean, there was no ambition of this type. Um, it, it wasn't even a thing. I, like I say, I was habitually doing the archiving anyway. Um, and this was more or less, sort of, I might as well make it open. Um, yeah, the first six months, there was like literally no one reading it. There was maybe, I remember it was like, you know, getting a one plus subscriber. It was like an exciting thing. Um, and then next day you get minus two, oh, going backwards. What's all right? What am I doing? But then you remember, look, you're not doing extra work you're doing this anyway it's just like do the newsletter it's like extra it's a little bit extra but it's not a huge um but then you start getting like comments from subscribers that are you know very getting value from it that really enjoy it and do all those types of things when you start getting that type of feedback that's when you realize you know what you're actually contributing something positive here um and, and you need to keep going um so so yeah there wasn't any plan for this to be the main thing um it, it, i remember for, for the first time when I didn't even understand that it could be a business in any way. Um, uh, you know, the first, uh, first, first time people were trying to sponsor it, I was like, no, like, what do you mean sponsor it? I, I didn't even, I couldn't even compute um, what they were talking about. Um, but then I realized, oh, 
Um, this actually might help solve uh, another type of problem um, because now this audience is is here and they're reading this um, uh, this content or they're listening to a podcast or watching a live stream or whatnot. Um, that audience might be super relevant to uh, companies that want to speak to that audience in a non intrusive way. Um, you know, they don't want to go and bang down the doors with like massive email campaigns or cold calling these days or whatever. Uh, but maybe they can align a little bit with Brain Food as a as a as a as a partner um and and be able to build brand and awareness and you know uh those types of good things with this audience so you know that's how it suddenly became something initially uh some you know, like to have money and then it became oh maybe i could self-sustain it and then you know three years or so ago maybe even longer than that um it became this could and should be the main thing because mm-hmm. so you've evolved into the you have a live um webinar type you know uh, crowdcast on a friday now regular as clockwork and you bring a whole host of guests from a, across the industry actually giving people a voice who probably wouldn't have had stage time or opportunity otherwise yeah absolutely so so it's, it's actually a really challenging format i mean i, I realize this myself but because it's like firstly it's every week so remember i've got this cadence right so it's, it's one of the problems of doing it a cadence is actually it becomes like quite a fixed thing uh the second problem is that it's a multi-guest multi-guest uh, show so it's not like just getting one person in it's like you know, three four people maybe more sometimes in this one show which means like tons of extra work uh, almost recruiting these people to do it um so yeah it's a lot of effort uh, but at the same time um it's supported very much by the fact that the newsletter had built up this audience over time uh, so the the webinar basically came in uh at least two years after the newsletter. So by that time, there was lots of people that were already into the newsletter and it became easier then to then have conversations with people and say, you know what, would you like to talk about this? Um, and you know there's an online community as well, which we talk about it. It's all often a good place where conversations can get, get seeded or ideas can be tested. Um, and then people who tend to, you know, be committed or passionate about a topic, you make a mental note of it and think, you know what, that person could be interesting if we ever did this type of show. Um, and you know, this person actually says something really smart. Let's get that person in immediately. And then that's basically how, um, you know, the acquisition of guests, if you want to call it that way, uh, works. Um, in, in terms of, do you want to, it kind of naturally becomes, um, diverse, I think, if that's the approach. So I think where a lot of uh, shows struggle is when, um, they, uh, set up, a, they don't have a discursive start to it in other words they pre-plan everything and they think right who can we get for this topic and they go and try and you know basically sell the pitch in um and that that's hard work you know you've got to then pitch the uh, the idea why is it worth this person's time yada 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 and the conversion rate i assume might be quite low which is why companies actually um have agencies that specifically do this right um you know there are people that book uh, guests for podcasts and stuff. Uh, so that's actually a big enough problem for this to be a full-time industry, a uh, full-time business for a lot of companies. So my, my approach is to say, look, if you start having conversations, almost never stop having conversations. You're going to encounter lots of people that want to say something. Um, and uh, those are the people that, you know, you should invite on. You don't need to necessarily look for expertise. One of the, one of the things that is very true about Brain Food Live uh, is that it, it's not there to solve a problem per se i'm not saying you know what listen to this expert it's going to solve it for you um we're going to we're setting the stage for a conversation to happen and from there there might be some like decent ideas that you could use um and and suddenly it becomes more accessible to people who might not walk around thinking themselves as experts it's like yeah i kind of do this this is how i do it that is enough uh for you to be you know a great guest for brain food life yeah a similar ethos that i've develop with this podcast i i deliberately don't gatekeep anybody who wants to come on i say they say what do you want me to talk about i said but if you want to talk about it this is your show i'd like to hear your view of the world or whatever that may be and that way i I, i'm not in charge of, of of having any bias judging anybody i just trawl the net out and say who'd like to be a guest and mm-hmm. everyone puts the same form in everyone does the same process and if you want to be on you're almost welcome and i think that that 
I've had some fantastic conversations with people I wouldn't have had conversations before. Yes, I cherry pick a few and say, oh, would you like to have a go one day? And they say, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, but often it's, it's it's organic. People just say, yeah, I'd love to have a go. And uh, yeah. I always ask each guest if they've got recommendations for other people. I get, I get some good leads and, and invite them as well. So, yeah, I think that's really, really important is to let the audience choose if the audience wants to be part of it as well. And uh, yeah, uh, absolutely right. Yeah get that variety get the difference so i can't believe an hour's up well we're just almost at the hour already i mean the time's flown past you've been absolutely fantastic and i've, I've enjoyed the, the conversation immensely how can people get hold of you what's the best way of of uh chatting to hung you know if you want to if you've like like what you heard um, I, I definitely subscribe to the newsletter. It's recruitingbrainfood.com. Um, typically, I'm able to communicate with people that subscribe because it's the same email you use to just talk to me, so I'm there. Um, otherwise, just 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 find me online. I'm basically on a, almost every sort of social platform, and I try my best to interact with people uh, on, on those places, even though uh, you know sometimes there's hidden inboxes which are hard to look at. I just looked at Twitter that has like two inboxes, right? And I realized, oh no, like 25 messages on one inbox I literally didn't realize it was there um, so yeah uh, recruitingbrainfood.com that's the best place to get updates best place to get the newsletter uh, and of course uh, connect with me as well on there yeah and, and your audience for that typically is in-house agency RPO recruiters HR topic dis discussed all over the spectrum of, of people isn't it and, and that's it it's basically anybody that cares about the concept of hiring people um, and working with them in, in a social organization you know, typically a company um, uh, that's the the sort of uh, things I typically talk about there fantastic brilliant so thank you so much so a huge thank you to you uh, the listeners uh, for tuning in and getting this far uh, please do subscribe if you're not already subscribed to future episodes of the inclusion bites podcast at bites please tell your friends tell your colleagues if you've enjoyed this i've also got a number of exciting guests lined up in future weeks uh, that i'm sure you'll be also inspired by and of course if you'd like to be a guest uh, you're most welcome please uh, let me know i welcome any feedback and suggestions on future shows and how i can improve to joe.lockwood at cchangehappen.co.uk so finally my name is joanne lockwood and it's been an absolute pleasure to host this podcast for you today catch you next time bye